Hello, my name is TJ Ong and I am a continence physician at the Royal Melbourne Hospital working with the Royal Park Continence Service. I am pleased to be asked to share my thoughts on multiple sclerosis and the neurogenic bladder. Multiple sclerosis or MS is the most common immune-mediated inflammatory demyelinating disease of the central nervous system. The largely accepted theory is that the body's own immune system causes inflammation of the insulating sheaths or nerves within the brain and spinal cord. Initially, this impairs how nerves conduct electrical impulses, but the body can respond and repair itself. But there is a component over time that leads to degeneration and permanent damage. MS is three times more likely to affect women than men, and the usual onset is around the age of 30. Most people will follow a relapsing and remitting course, but after 10 years or so, it becomes quite common for there to be progressive neurological disability. In some cases, there is no relapse or recovery, but rather a slow deterioration in neurological function right from the start and this separate form is known as primary progressive MS. This form occurs equally in men and women. Symptoms of MS can be quite varied depending on the location and severity of the affected nerves. People with MS often suffer from fatigue, muscle spasms, spasticity, and problems with sensation, balance, and vision. MS can also result in lower urinary tract dysfunction. The bladder muscle is known as the detrusor muscle. The most common dysfunction due to MS is detrusor overactivity. The detrusor is contracting before the bladder has reached capacity and before the person is ready to void urine. This leads to frequency and urgency. Sometimes the detrusor can also be underactive, leading to a weak flow, prolonged voiding time and incomplete bladder emptying. Indeed, the bladder can be both overactive in the storage phase and underactive in the voiding phase. MS can also commonly result in an incoordination of the detrusor and sphincter, called detrusor sphincter dyssynergia, or DSD. This results in voiding difficulty. If the sphincter is erratically opening and closing whilst the detrusor is contracting, it will result in an intermittent flow. If the sphincter is only partially relaxed whilst voiding, it will result in a continuous weak flow. If the sphincter does not relax at all, it will result in urinary retention. Whilst the detrusor is contracting against the closed sphincter, the pressure within the bladder rises. If this pressure is very high or if the pressure is sustained over long periods, there is a risk of reflux or backflow into the ureters and kidneys. This can lead to kidney scarring, damage and failure. Reflux can also lead to urinary tract infections. With DSD, the bladder might not completely empty due to closure of the sphincter. Residual urine increases the risk of urinary tract infections. MS can also affect bladder compliance. Compliance is a measure of how stretchy or stiff the bladder is. A stiff bladder or poorly compliant bladder will fill under higher pressure, and this increases the risk of reflux into the ureters and kidneys. Assessment of the MS bladder should follow standard principles, with high consideration for urinary tract ultrasound as well as urodynamics. It should always include assessment of bowel function as it is often coincidentally disturbed and can have a negative impact on the bladder function. The MS bladder may present with some or all of the above problems. Therefore, management is dependent on the symptoms and severity. Management must also be individualized to take into account the person's physical, cognitive and social situation. In general, the fundamental management principle is renal preservation by controlling bladder pressure to prevent reflux and infection. The secondary aims of management are to maintain continence and patient's preference.
Detrusor overactivity should firstly be addressed with non-pharmacological methods. Lifestyle modification includes adequate fluid intake, fluid modulation and caffeine reduction. Management and prevention of constipation is vital. Pelvic floor physiotherapy for pelvic floor muscle strength, urge deferral strategies and voiding dynamics. Transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation or TENS can be effective for some patients. Medications are frequently necessary. Antimuscarinics inhibits involuntary detrusor contractions and thus reduces urgency. Efficacy is dose dependent. However, its effectiveness is limited by side effects. About half of patients discontinue their antimuscarinics within six months because of constipation or dry mouth. Antimuscarinics can also cause blurred vision, confusion, and incomplete bladder emptying. The beta-3 adrenergic agonist, Myrobegron, mediates detrusor relaxation to increase bladder capacity and reduce urgency. Myrobegron is extremely well tolerated. However, it is prudent to monitor blood pressure and heart rate after its commencement. For intractable detrusor overactivity, intradetrusor botulinum toxin can be very effective. However, it does require repeated treatment approximately every nine months. Some patients will need to self-catheterize after the procedure, so patients should be capable of doing so prior to treatment. If DSD is present, management has to be individualized. It might be appropriate to accept a degree of avoiding difficulty and monitor for reflux and infection. Commonly, DSD would be managed with intermittent self-catheterization. The use of indwelling catheterization is avoided where possible, especially because of the potential complications with long-term use. Management of a poorly compliant bladder involves ensuring safe bladder pressures. Treatment is similar to that for detrusor overactivity, but generally less responsive and therefore needs more aggressive treatment. In reality, threat to the upper tracts seldom occur in MS despite the presence of DSD and impaired compliance. However, it should still be closely monitored. Detrusor underactivity in itself might be treated with double voiding or self-catheterization. Urinary tract infection prevention should be considered as well. Assessment and management of the MS bladder can be complex and challenging. By following basic principles outlined previously, Good symptom control can be achieved. Optimal symptom control can profoundly improve the person's quality of life, so escalation of treatment is sometimes advocated. Finally, symptoms can change over time, so long-term monitoring is advised. Thank you for your interest and attention.